but a conversation that I had with a, a woman in my office recently back at the school, just hearing the heartbreak that she's endured, the trials that she's walking through, there was wisdom that God gave me for her in the middle of our conversation. And the moment that she left, I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, this is for Tina C on Tuesday night. And it's just been cooking since then, just developing it into a message. But it has to do with the sovereignty of God. And that while he is sovereign, he is also good. Sometimes we have a hard time reconciling those two things, especially when we're in a battle and when we're in pain. But there are two things that we have to see together as much as the Holy Spirit gives us illumination. And about six years ago, I had the privilege of being in a pastor's conference. And at the end of it, all of the ministers there were invited to submit questions about anything ranging from family life to ministry to theology. And I was given a bunch of questions revolving around theology because I'm a nerd and I love that sort of thing. And one of the questions really caught my attention because it was a bit snarky. At least it read that way. And I wasn't sure what to make of what they were asking. But the question read like this, is God in control or just in charge? Answer carefully, thanks. <laughs> that last half was the snark, answer carefully, thanks. And at first I was unsure of what difference the person saw between the two options, being in charge versus being in control. And if I had to guess, I'd say that they saw God being in control as him being directly responsible for everything that happens in life, including evil. And we don't want to see God as directly responsible for evil because he is not. He's incapable of committing evil. God is light, the Bible says, and in him there's no darkness at all. And perhaps they thought that if he's just in charge, that means he's got the final say on things, but he's hands off enough that we can't accuse him of anything when bad things happen. And assuming I'm right about what they meant, I understand where they're coming from. That's a legitimate concern, but it's not a justifiable distinction. God is in charge, but he's also in control. And the fact that he is in control does not subtract from his goodness. And I encounter discomfort with the doctrine of God's sovereignty in Christians all the time, especially when we're hurting. And the more that I have counseled people through their crises and the more that I've taught on this concept, the more convinced I am that the church needs to understand this doctrine. And we're going to talk about it not just as some abstract concept. I want you to see where this intersects with real life. Why it matters on a Monday through Friday that God is sovereign and he is in control, not just over your life but over everything happening in the world around us. God being sovereign and being in control does not endanger his goodness. I'm hoping that by the end of tonight, we see that it magnifies his goodness. Now, to give you a definition, God's sovereignty refers to his absolute rule over his universe. When we speak of sovereignty, we are speaking of God's absolute rule over the entire universe. It's never a question of whether God is sovereign. The question is, how does God exercise his sovereignty? And that's something that Christians have always differed over in terms of answering that question. You've got Christians on one end of the spectrum that would insist on what I call sovereign control. God has control over all happenings in all places at all times because anything less than that diminishes his glory. If God doesn't control everything, you know, there's an old joke. What did the Presbyterian say after he fell down the stairs? Thank God that's over with. And some of you are like, oh, I don't get it. And that's okay if you didn't get it. That's why you're here. Well, because it's the idea that you were preordained to fall down the stairs. God predestined you to do that. So thank God it's over with. You passed that trial. And really, some Christians do believe that. And that's not some villainous false doctrine. The heart of that belief says God's honor is more important than anything else. Believing in God's sovereignty and his majesty is more important than believing in my freedom. And while that's not where I would land, and that's not the perspective I'm going to present to you tonight as we go on, that is a viable Christian perspective, and we need to be charitable toward brothers and sisters who hold to it. But then you have another end of the spectrum, what, what I would call sovereign permission. So God is still sovereign. But rather than controlling everything, he permits human freedom 
And the reason why that's sacred is because if you take that away, it diminishes his goodness. So over here, there's a fear that, well, if we take God out of the equation too much, well, then he's no longer majestic, he's no longer glorious. But then over here, if you make God too involved and too controlling, he becomes a tyrant. So you see why that's important? These are just ideas that Christians have formed over the years trying to understand, God, how do we make sure that we see you as good and not neglect your majesty? And this is what we do all the time when we're forming doctrine and theology. God is sovereign. It's a question of how he exercises that sovereignty. And the reason why that question matters to us so much is because we suffer. How many people flooded the altar tonight because they were in a battle? They're hurting. They're waiting for a victory. It matters a lot if God is sovereign. It's a very deep and painful question. We and the people we love are affected by pain. And when we get hit with pain, sometimes that can make us question the character of God. It can make us ask, if you're all-powerful and you really have control over everything, why are you permitting this? Why didn't you spare me from that experience? How can I call God good if he doesn't use his sovereignty to protect me from the things that I go through that cause me pain and make it difficult for me and cause discouragement? And what can end up happening is we become theologically double-minded because we see God's sovereignty as both a comfort and a liability. When our lives are spinning out of control and falling into chaos, we want to hear about an in-control, sovereign God who holds all things together. And we want the preacher to tell us when we see bad things on the news that God is still on the throne. But then when you see school shootings or natural disasters that take innocent lives, you don't really want to talk about an in-control God. You kind of want a God who's just as shocked as you are. He, he doesn't even know what's going on. Because you don't want him to be responsible for that. And that's not a good view to have either. We can't be double-minded in how we think about our God. We've got to understand him as he presents himself in his word. And our goal tonight is to protect our hearts from those questions and those accusations. And I want to give you three principles from scripture on God's sovereignty. Three principles from Scripture. These principles are going to form the outline for the rest of our night together. When it comes to God's sovereignty, when it comes to the control that he exercises over his universe, there are things that he wants, there are things that he wills, and there are things that he permits. In all of those categories, God is sovereign, God is in control. There are things that he wants, there are things that he wills, and there are things he permits. To say it another way, when we speak of what God wants, we're talking about what delights him. Amen. There are things he takes joy in. Jesus said when one sinner comes to repentance, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels. And so often we say the angels in heaven are rejoicing, but read it again. Jesus says there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels, meaning they're watching somebody else rejoice. Well, who else is there? It's the Father. The Father gets up and dances when sinners come home to repentance. So Jesus takes joy. There are things that he wants. He wants his church to thrive. He wants you to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. He wants you to find your calling and your destiny. But then there's a difference sometimes between what God wants and what God wills. There are things that he must do because of who he is. Maybe it's not what he would like to do. It's not something that delights him, but because it's right or necessary. He has to take a certain kind of action. And then there are things that he permits, things that he allows or even tolerates for purposes beyond our understanding. And that's where it gets really tough. And that's the one that we're going to spend the most time on this evening. We're not always going to be able to tell the difference between these categories. Scripture shows us that they exist. There really can be a difference between what he wants, wills, and permits. But we're not always going to be able to cleanly tell which one we're living in. But my hope tonight, again, is that if we look at and explore these things, it'll help us process our own experiences. And as we look at these, I want you to see them in a certain light, each of these principles. When we're talking about what God wants, that's beautiful. What God wants is beautiful. What he wills is righteous. What he permits is mysterious. Okay? What he wants is beautiful. What he wills is righteous. What he permits is mysterious. Let's tackle the first one, that what God wants 
is beautiful. Now, our sister who shared earlier about Jesus waiting to come back so that he could have mercy on the lost, she set me up beautifully because this is our first scripture. I want you to listen to 2 Peter 3, 9. This is the verse she was referencing. It says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's what God wants. He wants as many people as possible to get saved before he comes back and calls it a wrap with this world. That's what he desires. So his intention is that every day that goes by without the second coming, it's a chance for mercy. It's sovereignly ordained mercy for people. But there's an incidental side to that. It's not what God wants, but it's something that happens. Because he's leaving the door open for mercy, there's more opportunity for evil to take place, isn't there? And we don't have to hide our eyes from that. We can be, we must be honest about that fact. It tells us the value of human souls to God. He knows that by leaving the door open for just one more sinner to find his grace and his mercy, what if 10 more people find their way into sin? What if 50 more people end up getting hurt or wounded? There's cost to the mercy of God. There are things that he wants. He wants all people to come to repentance and be saved from the coming wrath. But not everything that happens is what God wants. God does not want his mercy to be used as an opportunity for sin. Let me give you a couple examples. Again, God is sovereign, but not everything that happens is what he wants. God never wants you to be tempted by sin. James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Amen. He never wants you to be tempted. But sometimes he permits it. God does not want, will, or even think of perversion. This is an important one. Jeremiah 32, 35, he's speaking of Judah's rebellion and love of idolatry. It says, they built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hinnom to offer up their sons and daughters to Moloch. They would burn their infants alive and call that worship. Though I did not command them, nor did it enter into my mind that they should do this abomination. So he says right there, you have begun to do certain forms of perversion that my mind can't even conceive. There are things that God doesn't even think about in his holy infinite mind because it is so unlike him. You talk about people who have been violated, their innocence robbed or stolen. God does not want that. No one should dare lightly, well, God is in control. It must have been predetermined. Absolutely not. It is never God's desire for people's innocence to be ripped out from under them. It is never God's desire or what he wants for people to be taken advantage of. Amen. To go even further with that, this one might shock you a little bit if you've not read it. God never wants to judge the wicked. Listen to Ezekiel 33, 11. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? God doesn't want to judge people. He doesn't want to send people to hell. He does not want people to live in sin. But this is where that gap comes in, the gap between what God wants and what God wills. God does not want to judge the wicked, but he will, mm -hmm. because he's just. God will do things that he does not delight in because they are right or necessary. He will do things that do not bring him joy because it's right. He's a just judge. And he is too good to allow wicked people who have violated others and trafficked other people and committed great evil to let them go into eternity, escaping all consequence for their sin. If you do not receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ for your sin, you will answer for your sin in the life to come. God will do things he doesn't delight in because they are right or necessary. God does not want to judge the wicked, but he will because he is just. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. 
Now think about that. That's terrifying. That's a terrifying thought. But the idea that Jesus is giving is, listen, if you cause one of these little ones to stumble into sin, if you offend them, if you take advantage of them, if you defile their innocence, you're better off being thrown into the bottomless ocean with no hope of escaping than standing before my Father on Judgment Day. Because that's going to be a lot scarier. That's going to be a lot more terrifying than the depths of the ocean. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Listen close. Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. God does not want to judge, but he will, because he's good, because he's just. Another example, God does not delight in making his people suffer, but he will afflict them to sanctify them or to make them holy. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God doesn't like watching you suffer. But if that's what it takes to make you perfect, if that's what it takes to help you get free of those lies and free of those bad habits, he will let it come into your life because he loves you. He doesn't delight in causing pain in the lives of his sons and daughters, but he will do it if that's what it takes to make you more like him. Hebrews 12, 5 through 7. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as his children. God doesn't delight in causing us pain, but sometimes he will. Because it's what we need to actually grow and become more like Christ. And this one can be really tough, that idea of willed suffering. Affliction that God has assigned to us, but you can't read your Bible and deny it. I've had people say, well, surely it's not God's will for us to suffer and experience pain. And I've had to look at them and say, uh, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> read Acts 9. Paul was called to suffer. Acts chapter 9, it says, He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Yeah, next time you go to some destiny conference, find God's call on your life. I guarantee you they will not call anybody to that. Which tells you something about the legitimacy of some of those conferences. You get that for free. And then when Paul prayed three times for Jesus to set him free from a thorn in his flesh, he was told no. He prays in 2 Corinthians 12 to keep me from becoming conceited because of the greatness of my revelations. A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, which is a really powerful way of saying no. I mean, y'all got excited. My grace is sufficient. Yeah, but remember, that's a no. Grace is sufficient means no, I'm not answering it. Well, he always answers prayer, but sometimes the answer is not yes. And we have to be okay with that because he's sovereign. He's sovereign and he's good. He knows what we need. He doesn't delight in putting thorns in our flesh. He doesn't delight in letting suffering come into our lives, but he will allow it. He will even ordain it at times if that's what it takes for us to become like him. But now we come to the tough one. What God permits. The mysterious part. And perhaps the clearest example of this in the entire Bible is the story of Balaam in Numbers 22 through 24. Let me give you a brief recap and we're going to read a couple verses. Balak, the king of Moab, is terrified of Israel. They've come out of Egypt they're going through the desert, they're surviving, they're conquering enemy nations, and he's thinking, I'm next. So he hires Balaam, who's kind of like a sorcerer or magician, says, hey, come and curse these people for me, I'll pay you lots of money. 
And Balaam goes to sleep that night. He prays to God to speak to him. And God comes and says, um, I don't care what he's paying you. You're not going to go. I have blessed those people. My will is to bless them. And you will not defy my will by cursing them. So Balaam gets up and like a good prophet, he says, no, God said, no, I can't go with you. So they offer him more money. And he basically nags God. Can I go? Can I go? And God says, all right, fine, you can go. But you're only going to say what I tell you. But this is really interesting. Numbers 22. God gives him permission to go. But he's not happy. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise, go with them. But only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning, sat on his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. But God's anger was kindled because he went. Now wait a minute, didn't you just tell him he could go? Why are you angry? Well, because again... God told Balaam his will. My will is that you stay home and you do not go. But since you are so insistent on defying me, fine, go. But I get the last word. I get the last word. Balaam was permitted to go. But in being permitted to go, he exposed the greed of his own heart. And later on, it led to the humiliation of the nation of Moab. But it gets even more complicated after that. So Balaam tries over and over again to curse Israel, to curse Israel. He's speaking every spell he can. He's offering up sacrifices. He's trying to get God to move against them. And God says, I'm not moving. I bless them. And you cannot curse them. So Balaam still wants to make money. So we find out in Numbers 31, verse 16, this interesting fact. Behold, these, on Balaam's advice, caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And so the plague came upon the congregation of the Lord. What happened? Balaam told Balak, listen, I can't change God's mind. As much as I try, I can't do it. So listen, do this. Take your prettiest girls, send them into the camp, and have them seduce the men into coming to your, your God's festivals. Because if they do that, they'll make God so angry, he'll curse them for you. You won't need to do anything. So he's still searching for ways around God's sovereign will. He's just that rebellious. And God even permits that. Because the young Moabite girls do go in. They seduce the men. They take them to the feast of their idols. Israel ends up engaging in all kinds of sin and then brings a plague on the congregation. So in permitting Balaam to do all this work around him, he uses it to test Israel's loyalty to him. God permits things that sometimes are beyond our understanding. It's mysterious. He's sovereign. He's in control. But sovereignty and being in control don't mean that he doesn't allow his will to be crossed. Because like Balaam, when people choose to do that, when we choose to run against what he has ordained for life or for this universe, you heap up judgment against yourself. And that's exactly what happened with Balaam, because he ended up being captured by Israel and put to death. And there's an important lesson here. God is sovereign, but he's never passive. Listen close. The story of Balaam shows us two important things. God is sovereign, but he permits his sovereign will to be defied sometimes. He is sovereign. He's in control. But he permits his sovereign will to be defied. And secondly... He's still in control when he's being defied because he gets the final word. He gets the final word. So sometimes you and I are going to look at situations in our lives and think, well, this can't be what God wants for me. You might not always know for sure. You might not always know for sure. But this is where some good news comes into play. There's a fourth principle that I want to throw at you here. There are things that God wants. There are things that he wills. There are things that he permits. But then there are things that he promises. There are things that he promises. And because he is sovereign, no one and nothing can stop him from fulfilling his promises. It doesn't matter how badly Balaam or Satan's or Pharaoh's of this life try to mess things up. If God has promised, you're going to see a victory. He's going to turn everything around. So we can see exactly He'll bring that wayward child home. He'll put that demon-possessed boss in line. He'll bring that crooked heart into alignment. He'll change that lying tongue. He'll get all that vain imagination out of their head. Whatever he promised you, he's going to do. 
Because all the promises of God are yes and amen to those who are in Christ. Thanks be to God. So what God promises is enlivening. What he promises is enlivening. We get really beat up dealing with the, mis the mystery of what he permits sometimes. It's like, what do we do? We're like, Job. why are you letting this happen to me? What have I done? But there are promises in the midst of that. Let me give you a few of them. God promises that all things work for the good of those who love him. Romans 8, 28. We know all those things work for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Another one, God promises strength to endure whatever is being permitted into your life. Isaiah 43, 1 through 2 say this, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. We can get all caught up wondering, well, why is there going to be water, Lord? Why is there going to be a furnace? Why is there going to be fire? He says, because you need it, but I'm with you. Amen. You don't always get explanations. You don't always get answers. Can I be honest with you? Answers don't do much for our faith. There's a difference between satisfying doubt and building faith sometimes. And answers satisfy doubt, but they don't always build faith. We're idolatrous. We get addicted to answers. And you can end up putting your faith in that. And you'll be loyal to God. You'll trust him so long as he explains himself. That's not faith. That's not the kind of faith that Jesus is worthy of. Whether he explains himself or not, we trust him. He owes us nothing. He owes us absolutely nothing. God promises a day of justice against all evil. Romans 2, 6 through 8, He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. And fourthly, God promises a new creation where evil is no longer There is coming a day when all the mystery is going to clear away, all the fog of what we can't make sense of is going to be gone, and we're finally going to see that beautiful design and tapestry that he's been working out from the very beginning. He is sovereign, and he is good. He is in control, but the way he exercises that control is never tyrannical. It's never on the other end of the spectrum, hands off and uncaring. God does exactly what we need. Revelation 21, let me read you a couple verses from there. Verse 1, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. We're not promised answers, but we are promised power. We're promised the future. We're promised hope. We are promised comfort and the presence of God no matter what is permitted into our lives. No matter how ugly the will of God needs to be for you, Jesus is with you. And he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. He will never leave you. So how do you see God's sovereignty? Is it a liability? Or is it a comfort? You know, some of you are in battles. All of you came down for different reasons tonight. Some of you are in battles that God has willed for you. He willed it into your life because there's something he wants to transform inside of your heart. And some of you are in battles that he didn't want for you. He didn't will it for you. Someone else imposed it on you. And his promise to you is that he's going to be with you in the midst of it. And sometimes it's tough to navigate the difference between those two things. I've had situations people sitting in front of me where I can tell them very clearly that is not what God willed for your life. Someone else imposed that on you, but his promise and the exercise of his sovereignty, he's not going to let this kill you. He's not going to let it destroy you. There have been other times I've had to tell people, God wants you where you are right now. 
He wants you where you are. Don't give up, don't back down, stay the course. And you watch what he does in your life. It's between you and the Holy Spirit how you need to respond to his sovereignty tonight. But however you do it, respond in faith. Respond in trust. And whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian here tonight, this is for you. If you're a believer, you just need to come to Jesus. And you need to thank him for understanding your pain and for dying for it. That he's already given you everything you need to win whatever it is you're walking through. Whether it's what he wanted, what he willed, what he permitted, doesn't matter. You rejoice that he's given you everything you need for the moment you're in right now. And if you're here tonight, and then you're not a Christian, or you're backslidden, you, you know Jesus, but you're away from him just because of some choices you've made, things you've embraced into your life, God's not angry with you. We read it. He doesn't want to punish you. He's not against you. He wants you to come home. He wants you to come home. He loves you. There is no one in the universe who can love you more than he does. And he's not ashamed of you. And you can come to him. And you can give him full control of your life. He's already in control. But he'd like us to acknowledge that and bend our knee to it. You just come and you ask him for forgiveness of your sins, but also for healing for the sins that have been committed against you. Because he cares about that too. He doesn't just want to forgive you of what you've done wrong. He also wants to heal you of the wrongs that have been done to you. Every part of your life is sacred to him. So I invite you to stand with me tonight. I'm going to pray. And if the Lord is speaking to you, you're welcome to come. And if you need to receive Jesus as your Savior, you need to get down here tonight. And I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Tim after that. But Jesus loves you. And the way he exercises his sovereignty, we're not going to understand it all. But we know that he's good in the way that he does it. He's loving. He's kind in the way that he does it. So let's pray. If God is speaking, you just begin to make your way down to the front. Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you so much that we don't ever have to be afraid of the fact that you're in control. Amen. God, some of us have been victimized by control. Lord, some of us have been abused by authority, figures that we should have been able to trust. Some of, us, some of us have been manipulated because we put trust in people or in relationships that were fraught with betrayal. And sometimes we can live under a fear that you're going to turn out to be like that. And we can resent the fact that you're in control. We can fear the fact that you're in control. But God, we reject those lies tonight. Lord, you're nothing like the people who hurt us. You're nothing like the people who betrayed us, oh God. We can trust you completely. Lord, we thank you that you're in control. We celebrate your sovereignty because we know that we're in the safest place we could possibly be. Even if life hurts right now, if we belong to you, we could not possibly be safer. So I pray that you'd speak to your sons and daughters tonight. And any time who don't know you but are responding to you, Lord, whisper to their heart and assure them that you have everything under control. And that's why everything's going to be okay. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Thank you. What a powerful word tonight. What a powerful word. Thank you so much, Pastor Nick. Thank you so much. How many were encouraged by that tonight? If you're here tonight, and, and as Pastor Nick said, for believers, that is an encouragement. And as Pastor Nick said, some of you are here tonight. Maybe for the, maybe as he was praying, you're saying, I'm not a Christian, but I've, but I've invited him to come in and change me. I, I want tonight for God to come in, that I can be born again. I want God to come and do that. And that's, with, with God, then you can go through those battles. You can go through those trials. You can't go through everything that passed. Because now, here's the difference. As a child and a son or daughter of God, here's the great thing. You can claim those promises tonight. You can claim those promises tonight. You can claim those promises tonight. I'm so thankful for that word tonight. And so we're, we're just so grateful for what the Lord has done tonight. Can we sing one more before we go tonight? What a great night has been in the Lord.